All right. So again, I'm Brother Judah from the Congregation of Israel, a representative of the NMP. We are the Biblical School of Global Liberation for All Oppressed People. And this will be episode one of our podcast, What is to be Done? And today uh, we want to begin our episodes with a discussion on love. What is it exactly? And we're arguing that is more than just a sentiment, but it is a revolutionary force. And since we approach the Bible from a social political perspective, or we say also we approach the Bible scientifically, we're going to look at a couple of passages written in a letter of 1 Corinthians by the apostle and elder Shaul or Paul. And what we plan to do is to look into the teachings and the sentiment of this apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we are, we're going to examine it and put it in the context of revolutionary work. The um, sentiment of charity that I am accustomed to and that I have heard growing up is that charity is this love and charity is love. And we wanna give a clear definition on what this means. But charity is love, I was told. And that this charity, the sentiment of it is this emotional sentiment of being nice to people, you know, uh, whatever that is, whatever nice is, I guess that can be uh, relative. And that you pretty much bear because they say charity is long suffering. So it's put in this context, you just bear your sufferings. You don't do nothing about it. You just bear it. You know, if someone's trying to uh, uh, oppress you and plunder you, you just handle it. And that is the sentiment that would keep people in slavery, no matter what race, whether you was an indentured European, whether you were a, uh, a, a part of the slave, or should I say labor camps of the Chinese, or you were stolen from the West Coast of Africa, this idea of love and charity is that you just bear it, you know? Whatever they do to you, you just, you just, just bear the pain. And one day, that one day that God will come out of the sky and he would save you. Needless to say, if the abolitionists carried that sentiment in America or the Jacobins in Europe and France, Toussaint Overture, which are part of the Jacobins movement, it, you know, they realized that they had to do something about their plunder. But when you hand a person a Bible and tell them to bear it and you take charity and put it in the context of be still and be plundered, then I am arguing that is a misuse of the text. So what I would like to do today is look at the text and examine the words that the apostle saw or Shaul was using, and then, uh, then uh, 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 put it in juxtaposition with other writings of men, not just these men that we're gonna look at, they wasn't authors, or should I say, people who just wrote novels. The records we read are journals and speeches. You know, there some are pamphlets, but a lot are speeches and journals, live, real life activity of men struggling for liberation. And so I want to look at their sentiment and see if what they're saying 
and their sentiment. We want to see the relation that it will bear with the writings of the Holy Scriptures. We want to further prove through these episodes that the Bible itself isn't some type of religious uh, uh, um, superstitious text and you can sort of put the Bible on par to the superstitious Greeks who, 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 who were ignorant and, and didn't know much. And they believed that there was a man sitting in the clouds, who sent down lightning bolts. And no, we, 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 we really wanna get away from the baggage, which many have put on the Bible. And we wanna show, no, the Bible is actually a liberating tool. It is a guide to liberation for all oppressed people. And that it isn't a book of fairy tales or superstition. And I will advise people to really learn of it because I have heard people say this about the Bible, how you know it was just people didn't know no better and they were superstitious and they believed a God was sending down lightning bolts and this and that. So when I would ask people who would tell me that, I said, have you ever read the Bible? And quite often people will say, no, they haven't read it. And I said, that's very interesting that you're really opinionated on it. I couldn't even tell you about a movie I've never seen. And you, you're quite opinionated on a book that you have never read. Here it is, a book over a thousand pages, you never read it or a book over a thousand pages and you only read pieces of it, but you running it down like you know it in and out, but you really don't. Only thing you know is what people have told you. And so what we have heard about charity, you know, and I remember in, in our organization, early days, learning and, 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 and experiencing things when people try to bring this charity and long suffering, it's like you just had to bear with the evildoer, no matter what they did, you know, they act in a fool, you know, well, they the, uh, a child of God. Well, I really never held that sentiment, but because I was around people with that, then, you know, unless I be the bad guy, then I sort of just got to wait. I got, I have to wait things out. That's just a manner of warfare. And so, no, I don't believe there's a lot of war in the camp. I believe that in organizations, if you have nothing but backbiting and strife, you have to re-examine if you really are in love, if you really are in the spirit, or AKA have a changed consciousness and a moral standard. And that's what we're gonna to learn today about love. Now, love also, what we're gonna find, it, um, it corresponds also, and God willing, in future, uh, episodes, we're going to talk about the correlation with the tabernacle or the temple of the 12 tribal confederacy, whom the people call the Jews, and how that tabernacle and temple had a teaching that described, or it was a, 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 a physical carrying out, a symbolic carrying out of the human being attaining unto awareness, awakeness, and entering into um, a new consciousness and a change of the conscience. So we get this awakening, this consciousness, we become conscious of what is happening. And then when we are learning and we're doing what is written in the text and laboring for liberation, this helps form our conscience. But first we must be made conscious. And this is what the tabernacle teachings bring about. And all of this has to do with this word love that people speak of. Now to get into this, this, this deal of love, and this is briefly what I was talking about. This is a demonstration of love. Um, and the procession from the brazen altar to the holy of holies is this individual receiving his higher consciousness. And how does he receive this higher consciousness? By acts of love. And when we're talking about love, we're going to show you that this is synonymous with righteousness. Righteousness is synonymous, synonymous with justice. 
and ultimately the love that is spoken of in the biblical text and the Greek text is talking about a moral standard. You, you must, if you don't have a moral standard, then you have nothing. And this is what the apostle Saul is arguing. You have to have a moral standard. So even people who, who, who's, who's uh, struggling for liberation, a lot of liberation movements today have gone haywire because, or they have failed because the, they don't have a strong moral standard. And this is important in liberation and uh, liberation for people as well, for, for the entire globe. So the text we wanna examine first will be in 1 Corinthians. And I wanted to bring this snapshot out, out of the interlinear. So we can read this out of the King James and out of these, the, the, the interlinear. Um, so when we <clears throat> go to 1 Corinthians 13, this is this charity chapter, charity. And a lot of people have different names and ideas when it comes down to charity or love. And um, boy, I just, just think of so many people in my life that say, well, we need to love each other. We need to do this. We need to love each other. <laughs> Yeah, that is absolutely true. And the more I have studied, then I realize before we can love each other, we actually got to find out what it means. Now, in this text here, I'll, I'll be uh, going back and forth uh, with this text and the King James Version. In 1 Corinthians 13 and, four, 13 and 1, I'll start with verse 1, and then we will pick up the, the main text here. And then we want to examine some um, revolutionaries, statesmen, if you will, men who sacrifice their life for the greater good of humanity. And uh, let's get started here. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, charity, let's get right down to it. This, chari this charity here in interlinear is the same in verse four, we're gonna to get to it. The interlinear just have love. Now, this love that's interpreted into interlinear as love, in our old English, we have charity, one and the same. It is the Greek 26, Greek number 26, agape. And I remember that word growing up when they would talk about agape love, you know, the divine love of God. And that's true. See, our arguments often isn't a, 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 uh, arguments that just disqualify other arguments. Our arguments, we would say, broaden the scope. Like, you know, you're looking at it from a position that it can be broadened you, to, to get more in depth of what's being said. So yes, agape love is this love of God. But from the Greek word that's being used of agape, where we get love or charity, we also have goodwill. So it has here the definition, love, goodwill. But its usage is love, right? Benevolence, goodwill, or esteem. But notice the description in the word studies. Keep in mind benevolence, because we're going to look at benevolence. What is it? To, to, in one context, the capitalists have taught us benevolence is none other than handing out sandwiches and band-aids. But we're going to find out is more to it. Yes, we can hand out sandwiches, band-aids, soups, and everything else. But it's, it's much more to it. Agape, properly love, which centers in moral, 
preference. The apostle Saul is arguing about morality, morals. He's explaining, if I speak with the tongues of men or of angels and have not morals, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I can go through the motions, but if I don't have a inner morals, then it's useless. Now, it's important for us to find out the context of the morals in which the apostle Saul is bringing to the table. And this is described as he further reads, or as we further read. Now you see here, love centers in moral preference. So too in secular ancient Greek. This is agape. It's talking about morals. Agape focuses on preference. Likewise, the verb form agapeo in antiquity meant to prefer. In the New Testament, agape typically refers to divine love. That's what it refers to. Meaning what? What God prefers. But the basic definition is moral preference. Moral preference. So if we look into the, I don't, I don't have it here as far as a, a screen, but if you look it up in the uh, dictionary, the um, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, moral, it says of or relating to principles of right and wrong in behavior, ethical. So we're talking about ethics or morals. Saul is explaining, you could do, you give everything away. If you don't, you, you can do all the physical activity, but if you don't have an inward moral or ethic, then you're nothing. What is ethics? Because this is what we find out when we talk about moral preference. Ethics, according, ethic, according to the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, is the discipline, the discipline, dealing with what is good and bad and with moral duty and obligation. So this idea of ethics and morals isn't an outward thing per se. It is something that happens inwardly. You have this inward dealing and contemplation of what is good. So as the conscience, conscience is being formed, you are developing an ethic or a moral preference of what's good and what's bad. If you don't have that moral preference of what is good and what is bad, then you're nothing. You're just like sound and brass. Now, how do we determine what is good and what is bad? Well, he's going to explain it so you can understand what moral preference we ought to have. Now, he says here in 1 Corinthians, again, at verse 2, chapter 13, he says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains. If I have no moral ethic or charity, I am nothing. I'm nothing. See, you got a lot of people who could sit up here and tell prophecy. And when he's saying faith, he's just talking about the determination to do something and the belief. The capitalists have faith in their system. The guy who will spend his last bit of money to invest have faith that his fortune will come. So when we're talking about faith, it isn't always something holy, but you can have that determination. But if you don't have a moral ethic, it's nothing. If you can prophecy, when he's saying prophecy, he means speak under inspiration. It isn't always telling the future. You can speak, you could be an excellent speaker. You could understand many deep sayings. We see this all the time in the religious world and in the political world. You have great speakers. You have men who can articulate themselves well. Uh, uh, they can speak 
very well. They understand, they're, they're intelligent. They understand mysteries and sciences, but they don't have a moral ethic. If they don't have a moral ethic, then they're nothing. Verse three reads here. So we're looking at this moral ethic. We're going to get to another part too. We're going to get back to it. Hold on. I'm sorry. I went too far. I don't have verse three here yet. So we'll be approaching verse four next. He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have no moral ethic, it profiteth me nothing. Nothing. Well, who would do that? Man, people do that at war. You will have a guy at war. He could be fighting for the imperialists. He would jump on a grenade, blow himself up to save his platoon. But it's the same platoon, possibly, that just finished raping all of the girls of the village they, just, they destroyed. So you can do that. But you still need a moral ethic. So everything he's describing here, once we understand it on a global scale, yes, people perform these feats constantly, given their lives for whatever they believe in. But his context is this charity or this moral ethic. This context, he's going to explain what this moral ethic is that you must have, you and I must have in order not to be counted as nothing or useless. And that's why it's very important to deal with this because we, I have heard love so much. Love this, love that. If as many people love truly as, they, as, they, as, it come, as it rolls off their tongue, we would have been free a long time ago. The globe, the people of the earth would have been free a long time ago. But what we find is men, they don't really understand love. They really don't have a moral ethic. Not the moral ethic or the moral preference that the apostle is speaking of. Remember, agape is this moral uh, preference. And he's going to explain. Now, notice what he's explaining here about this moral preference. He says, the moral preference or love or charity is patient, is kind. Love not, love not enviousness. And let me read out of King James. I'm just reading this. It says, love not is envious. Love not is boastful. In other words, they don't love what is envious. They do not love what is boastful. Or the moral ethic that he's speaking of isn't envious. This moral ethic that he's speaking of isn't boastful. And this moral ethic that he's speaking of isn't puffed up. Now let's examine this because when we look at patience, slave master could beat you all day. You just be patient and bear because one day Jesus coming out of the sky. And if you dare to run off, if you dare to run off from the master, then you know, you, you, you got to be obedient. You can't run. You have to be patient and bear it. People cheating and plundering all the time. You just have to deal with it and bear it. Because these are the definite, the limited definitions and sentiments they have given us of patience. Or in our King James Bible, it says long suffering. So let's read it there. It says, charity suffereth long and is kind. And you have to think of what people think of when we talk about kindness. All right, we're going to examine it. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Let's start there. Let's look at this charity or this love in the context of kindness. And then I want to show you something in relation to what we're reading here. And what's so interesting to me is that when I read this text and I read the writings of Mao or uh, or, 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 or Lenin, or Marx, they, it's amazing 
how they will line up with the text more than people who claim that they believe the Bible. Now, this moral ethic or this moral preference, and when we're looking at ethic, this discipline to dealing with what is good and bad. So he's going to explain what's good and bad. What is good is patience, a moral ethic of patience and a moral ethic of kindness. Now watch this, patience. Let's see if I have that down here, this idea of patience. And when we're looking at patience, this is the Greek 3114. Mac rack mothumil. Mac, excuse me, I said rack, excuse me. Mac rothumil. Mac rothumil. All right. Look what is the first word of patience? To persevere. Think about that. To persevere. To be patient. Is used as long suffering because actually that is true. If you are being brutalized, that is long suffering. But in what context are you being brutalized while you're laboring for liberation? And you are persevering and you're long suffering to not give up? Or are you just taking the beating and doing nothing? to help yourself and no one around you. That's really not persevering. That's actually giving up. You can argue in a literal sense. But some will say, well, no, you know, you're still holding on to the Lord. In your memory knowledge. But when we act upon the faith of the Lord, it's an action. So what are your actions? Well, your actions will be struggling for justice and while they're tormenting you, whether you're in prison or whether you're being beat or whether you're being killed as a martyr, you won't give up. You will persevere to accomplish the task. This is suffering long. You have a task ahead of you, but the religious world don't tell us the task. The task is to be beat, to suffer until a man come out of the sky or you disappear. That's not actually what the text is arguing. That's not what it's saying. This moral or the, the, the morals or these principles of right and wrong. One, you, we must persevere. Persevere to be patient. So look what it says, properly long-tempered. To defer anger, that's true. Refusing to retaliate with anger because of human reasoning. This is the basic religious, that's, all, that's where they leave you. Refusing to retaliate. Okay, you might not lift up arms, but your retaliation could be to escape. Your retaliation could be a protest. Your retaliation could be non-compliance or civil disobedience. But when you just leave people here, don't retaliate. That's not necessary. Civil disobedience is to persevere. They still beating you. They still spraying you with hoses. They still throwing you in prison executing you or your family, your comrades, what do you do? You persevere. Now, there's something else I want to bring out with this. Something else I want to bring out with this argument. Kind. Kind. Now notice what he's saying about kind. Oh yeah, be nice to people. You know, soft spoken. You know, you, you know, you know what we hear about kind. 
but it's very interesting. What does kind, to be kind, right? But notice the, the argument of being kind. The strong exhaustive concordance, be kind. What is it explaining? What does it mean? What is the action of being kind? To show oneself useful. That is, act benevolently, be kind. To act benevolently. But what have they taught us benevolence is? What is it? Don't retaliate, just take the plundering. No, I am to persevere. Once I understand, and watch, Saul is going to uh, 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 confirm this argument because he's going to add a little later that uh, true morals hates unrighteousness. True morals will struggle against unrighteousness and it will persevere and it will be kind. And what does that mean? It will act benevolently. But if we have been limited on benevolence, then we might have a problem. Let me explain, let me read something to you. Let me, let me, I'm gonna read this definition to you. Let me see, I think I got it down here. So I don't have to pull out my uh, big dictionary. Benevolence. Out of the Webster's, in fact, let me read it because there's a couple of definitions there that I wanna use. Thought I had it right by me. Hold on one moment. Okay. Well, what was song here? Okay. I'll put it up. Wait a minute. There you go. Now, when we're talking about benevolence, let's 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 look and see something very interesting. If to be kind is to act benevolently, uh, what will we find when we look up benevolence? Benevolence. And I think it's so important to research and to look up words. Uh, other than that, we could have some people just telling us anything. And if they can tell us anything before you know it, they have created a context that is just simply unbiblical and a context. And they, have, they, they will have created a context in the sentiment that does not change the world at all. Um, in fact, they actually will find themselves walking contrary to the will of God. And we definitely, in this first discussion, we want to tie this in and um, look at, they gave us, uh, little time here, about 45 to almost an hour. And then from there, we will follow up with another discussion as we look into this further. But right now, I just want to get this benevolence for you out of the collegiate dictionary because I can say it, but they, you know, I wrote down some notes, but I believe there was even another uh, definition in there that I want to bring out. So here, benevolence, almost there. And it's very interesting what they have here. To act benevolently.
benevolence. Where are you? All right. Um, benevolent, out of the collegiate, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, marked or, excuse me, marked by or disposed of doing good. Now we're looking at kind, kind is doing good. It's just not giving a person a compliment or, you know, speaking nice words and talking about how pretty your dress is today, or I like your hat. And every time a person walk past, you know, you, 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 you know, walk past your house, you're saying hi. Okay. Benevolence, or should I say kindness is more than that. It is the act. And this leads into other discussions as we have had before getting in depth on what it means to do good. But notice Saul is going to argue it in this chapter. He says, dispose of or marked by or disposed of doing good. B definition, organized for the purpose of doing good, a society. Now, organized for the purpose of doing good. So if you are organized, let's say the abolitionists, they are organizing what some would call the Underground Railroad to liberate those who were plundered by the Southern aristocracy. Is that kindness? Is that to act benevolently? And what if they're being, what if they being put in prison because they're teaching the slaves how to read? They're helping the slaves escape or as the capitalists say, to steal away. And like John Brown or any of them, people who struggled and lost their lives, people who were beat and maimed because of them struggling against the injustice and organizing, whether it was Nat Turner or Toussaint Overture, organizing against injustice. Isn't that doing good? Isn't that organizing for the good? So the acts of Toussaint Overture, or the acts of uh, the, the, the abolitionists. That's kindness. Those are acts of kindness. And for them to not give up through all of the hostile uh, hostility against them, that's long suffering. That's perseverance. And why are they doing it? They're doing it because of charity or a moral preference. Now, if we're looking at the moral preference, this kindness or to act benevolently and benevolence is also a action to organize for the purpose of doing good. So if we're organizing to liberate the oppressed, isn't that kindness? In our organizing to liberate the oppressed, we're persecuted, we're hated. As the Messiah said, they should deliver you up and kill you and think they're doing God a service. And if you don't give up, then guess what that is? Patience long suffering. Why? Because you have a moral standard for justice. If you don't have that, you're nothing. So people who say they love, what are their acts of kindness? That's why I say it, it don't stop at passing out sandwiches. We are compelled. We have a moral obligation to struggle against the powers of darkness. We have a moral obligation to struggle against oppression. And uh, any type of force that is injuring and destroying innocent people. That is charity. So all of the people with charity, but yet they can rest ashore or rest themselves just fine having their wine and cheese, uh, uh, you know, living in a comfortable homes, 
comfortable beds, indoor plumbing, while the rest of the world suffer. But yet they say that they're in love and filled with this Holy Ghost or ultimate, it, it, it just simply means this Holy Ghost is to change the consciousness to make you awake. So from being asleep, it changes you to awareness. And then that changes the conscience. And then with a conscience, you develop this moral preference that will walk in benevolence, organizing for the good. And no matter what comes in the way, you will not be deterred. You will not be intimidated. And next session, we're going to look into that out of the prophets as we look at more uh, uh, revolutionary writings. But right now, Look at this moral preference, right? This idea of uh, charity being a moral preference. Now, I want to read a text out of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Pe Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. On page 89. And this is his sentiment as well. This is his sentiment. And then I'm going to read, let's see, we can... Okay, yeah, got a couple of more minutes. I'm going to squeeze Lennon in there, most high willing, and then we're going to pick it up, most high willing, on our next episode, and we're going to continue to look at this idea or this sentiment of love, the biblical sentiment of love, which is a uh, the Bible itself. It is the, the, the text, the record, the manuscripts that guides men to liberation. And this will be in just juxtaposition to the Western sentiment of love that everybody can use and, and it, it just roll off their tongue real easy, real freely. All right, but notice what Friere says. If we're looking at love as a moral preference and this moral preference is no matter what, you're gonna hold to it. You're gonna persevere through it. You, you're gonna hold to your moral standard of what is right and wrong, no matter if your life depends on it, you want to persevere or be patient and suffer long through it. And that moral standard will be walking in benevolence or the text says to be kind. That means to walk in benevolence and action. So therefore this leads us into a whole nother world of things. Once we take this, this language of the apostle out of the grasp of the capitalist Christian, so-called Christian, because they're not really Christians, and put it in the hands of the real followers and those who desire to be followers of the prophet and peasant who's the sit on the throne of David, the elect of the Elohim, Yahushua ben Dawid. And if we are to become a part of that body, of this messianic body, then we must learn this. Then it will make sense. The works he did, we will do. He persevered, didn't he? He was persecuted, he was hated, and ultimately executed by the Romans. But what did he stand on? The elimination of plunder. He told the rich men to redistribute their wealth. These were acts of kindness. He dealt benevolently when he organizes apostles and begin to teach them a way that will change the world and that will undermine the entire system built on imperialism and mammon. They, these were acts of benevolence and the apostle Paul will support this argument. Now, as I said, let me get to Friere. He says here on, in chapter three, Chapter three of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He argues this. Domination reveals the pathology of love. Sadism. And the dominator and uh, masochism, masochism, excuse me, masochism and the dominated. Well, masochism, it is uh, the pleasure of being abused 
or dominate it. And that's pretty much what Western theology, the, the sentiment it gives, uh, ma masochism. Uh, sadism is the delight in cruelty. So what he's explaining in this relationship of sadism, you delight in being cruel to people and then you have this masochism, which you begin to accept it. You, you begin to take pleasure, if you will, in the cruelty. And this pleasure, you have been deceived to take pleasure into it because you've been told, you, you've been coerced or deceived, I should say, and forced into accepting this into your psychology that you're doing a good thing by just being brutalized, by being dominated, by suffering and not doing anything. You develop this psychology of masochism. But he explains further, sadism is the dominator and ma uh, masochism and the dominated. Because love is an act of courage, not fear. Love is commitment to others. And in our upcoming episode, God willing, we're going to examine this further. Love is the commitment to others. Saul is going to explain this, but I want to show you how this plays out before we close. No matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love or charity or moral preference when you are concerned with the oppressed, this is acts of benevolence. No matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is committed to their cause. That's kindness. You know, not walking past and tipping your hat when you walk past a lady or, or opening up a door. Yeah, you, you can put that in a classif classification of kindness, but the bottom line is, what is the biblical argument what, what, what is the Bible trying to teach us? No matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. And this commitment, because it is loving, is dialogical. As an act of bravery, love cannot be sentimental. As an act of freedom, it must not serve as a pretext for manipulation. In other words, when you're liberating people, you can't use this action for self-serving. And this is what Paul's going to explain. You don't have the moral standard. Therefore, if you're doing it to be self-serving, you you're not really acting in benevolence. You're not acting in kindness. You're trying to serve yourself. Your moral preference isn't proper. Now, with that being said, this moral standard, this act of this act of freedom, it says love must generate other acts of freedom. Otherwise, it is not love. Only by abolishing the situation of oppression is it possible to restore the love which that situation made impossible. So we're looking at the basis of this agape or this love, it's kindness and it's long suffering. It's kindness are acts of benevolence. The long suffering is to persevere through these acts of benevolence and these acts of benevolence, just like Paulo Freire argued, wherever you see the oppressed, you're there for their cause. Now, for this session, we're going to read one more account and we're going to close. And God willing, we're going to pick it up next week. That's not to say we won't have any other casts going on during the week, but this session in particular of what is to be done and discussing this subject, we're going to pick it up most high willing next week. But right now, I want to go into a 1920, October 2nd, 1920 document, the task of the youth leagues. And uh, I want to point a couple of things out when we're looking at acts of love. And when we looked at love, what else did we find? 
we found when we're looking at love, we're looking at a agape, which is a moral preference. It, it centers around a moral preference. In fact, it says, likewise, the verb form agapeo in antiquity meant to prefer. So we're looking at this moral preference, acts of benevolence, which leads us into kindness. Now notice what this is a document, the task of the youth leagues by Vladimir Lenin. He's gonna argue on morals. And this is what we're gonna close with today and then we're gonna open it up for chat, okay? We're gonna open it up for some chat, but we're gonna close for today's episode as we begin to, end, but we got more to read, God willing, we will read more. Uh, but it says here, and when I mean read more, we want to get really acquainted with whom I am arguing are men and women who struggle for kindness. Men and women who practiced love, AKA moral preference of justice. That's what we're going to include a little later as we walk through that. Love is the affection to do right. It is simply the acts of justice. He says, communist morality. In this document, you can find on marxist.org, marxist.org, okay, with an S. Uh, just type in task of the youth leagues. Uh, marxist.org link should pop up. And this document probably depend on your computer it should be no more than 20 pages. Sometimes as low as 16. But it says here, communist morality or agape or charity is that which serves this struggle and unites the working people against all exploitation. I'll read that again. Communist morality or charity is that which serves this struggle and unites the working people against all exploitation. Is that benevolence? According to the just raw definition, uniting the working people against all exploitation are these acts of benevolence. These acts of benevolence is this truly organizing for good works? If we can conclude or all agree to help the people and deliver them from all exploitation is a good work, then we will have to argue that Lenin here when he's speaking of morality or a moral preference, his moral preference is to struggle and unite the people against all exploitation. We, you, we've come to the conclusion if benevolence means to organize for the purpose of doing good, is this a good work? And if this is a good work, then we can apply this teaching of Lenin right to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when he said love or your moral preference should be kindness. And when we look kindness up, it means to act benevolently, to act benevolently, okay? This is what we find when we're looking at kindness. To show oneself useful, in fact, the exhaustive concordance says to show oneself useful would Lenin and the party of workers find themselves to be showing themselves useful when they are struggling against the oppression is this kindness is this charity is this love and he's arguing already this is his moral standard this is their moral preference. 
Communist morality is that which serves the struggle and unites the working people against all exploitation, against all petty private property. For the petty property puts into the hands of one person that which has been created by the labor of the whole of society. In our country, the land is common property. But suppose I take a piece of this common property and grow on it twice as much grain as I need and profiteer on the surplus. Suppose I argue that the more starving people there are, the more they will pay. Would I then be behaving like a communist? Would that be charity? No, I will be behaving like an exploiter, like a proprietor. That must be combated. To fight against it, then these are acts of benevolence or kindness. And to continue and to fight against it, whether you to fight to the death for it, to willing to sacrifice your own life for it, then that is suffering long, long suffering or perseverance because of your moral preference to struggle against it or to combat the exploiter and proprietor. If that is allowed to go on, things will revert to the rule of the capitalists, to the rule of the bourgeoisie, as has more than once happened in previous revolutions. To prevent the restoration of the rule of the capitalists and the bourgeoisie, we must not allow profiteering. We must not allow individuals to enrich themselves at the expense of the rest. The working people must unite with the proletariat and form a communist society are these acts of benevolence. Forming this society to combat the profiteering and the exploiters. This would be acts of benevolence. Not just tipping your hat now, or helping a cat out of the tree. These are the acts of benevolence that changes the world. And these are the acts of benevolence that the Western theologians and all of their running dogs have left out. I don't care if you call yourself an Israelite. I don't care if you call yourself a Western Christian, a Baha'i, a Muslim, no matter what it is. We must find truly what it is that changes the world. And we're finding that we must, Lenin argued according to his moral preference or, his, or the charity to struggle in acts of benevolence, to struggle against the evil. He showed the demonstration of kindness. And he's saying, we must not allow profiteering. We must not allow individuals to enrich themselves at the expense of the rest. The working people must unite with the proletariat and form a communist society. This is the principal feature of the fundamental task of the League and the organization of the communist youth. And God willing, we're gonna continue this and we're gonna look into more writings and uh, we're gonna bring in uh, some more linen writings. And this is just for this episode, for the episodes dealing with this uh, love. This love, is it a, 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 a just a, 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 a emotional sentiment? Or is the love that the Bible talking about a revolutionary force that changes the world? And so we approach the Bible, like I said, from a social political perspective. And what we want to do is show you how the Bible is intimately connected with world affairs. And if we study history, if we study society and become theoreticians, and we allow ourselves to be educated, to be social scientists, then I believe that you will enter into a world of biblical understanding that uh, is it, it, it's, it's amazing. That's what I would argue. That has been my experience so, thus far. And God willing, I pray that it will get better. 
Now, to, this was our very first uh, install or episode of what is to be done. God willing, we will be coming to you, bringing you more information, uh, news, uh, uh, discussions, readings, dialogues, and the intent is to find out what is to be done, the path we must take to bring liberation or otherwise known as salvation for the people of the earth. I'm Brother Judah. I'm going to close out for today's episode. And most high willing, we will meet again. So I say peace to all who's listening and was um, fellowshipping with us today.